perfectionism. Is it true that God will not forgive your sin if you repeat it? And by repeating it, you demonstrate that you are not repentant and reject that forgiveness in any case. What? <laughs> Let's get into it. Now, if you, like myself, lack the common sense to stay off the internet, and particularly religious Facebook groups, then you will probably have seen posts like this. You all love John 3.16, but you never bother to look up two verses to see how to believe. Ellipsis, you give up repeated sin. Now, he goes into John 3.14-16, through 16. he talks about Moses lifting up uh, the serpent in the wilderness, the bronze serpent on the pole in the wilderness. Uh, and then he wants the readers to go back and reference Numbers 21, from which this story comes. Uh, and I believe this is the KJV version he has. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed to the people, then the Lord said unto Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. They acknowledge their sin to live. To acknowledge your sin is to stop doing them. To acknowledge your sin is to lift Jesus up. To acknowledge your sin is to believe in Jesus. To lift up Jesus is to uphold the reborn image. You stop sin because you believe God doesn't want animal children. Stop now. I get it. Don't sin. I mean, the Bible says this over and over again. Sinning is bad. Spoiler alert. You know, it, it, yes, sin is bad, but this betrays a crucial lack of understanding of forgiveness. You see, what's happening here is that the primacy is being put on the individual. The onus is on you as the, the, the Christian, the repentant believer to stop doing your sin. And only with, with, only when and if you have stopped that sin will the application of Christ's death be bestowed. It's nonsense. No, it really is nonsense. Now, I get the idea that if somebody continues to sin, it may be an indicator that they're not actually repentant of that sin, but it is not a guarantee that they're not repentant of that sin. Consider, if you would, and allow me to look it up because I was not smart enough to do it in advance, Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, not the New International Version, but let's do the English Standard Version. Here we go. Consider Paul's argument, Paul, an apostle, who you would expect would be saved. Now, if you cannot be better than Paul, then it seems like you're not saved. What Paul says at the end of Romans chapter 7, now he's talking about his struggle with sin. Uh, let me see, what shall we say, this is the beginning, what shall we say, that the law is sin? No, 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 skip forward. For we say that the law is spiritual, the flesh is sold under sin. Let's continue to go forward. For I know, verse, verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my flesh. He's talking about sinful flesh here. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Saith the Apostle Paul. Continue. Verse 19, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on Doing, I keep on doing. That sounds like a repetition of sin. Hmm. I wonder what that means. The, e the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who does who do it, no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So that I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Hmm. Does that sound like something an unbeliever would say, that they delight in the law of God? But I see that my members, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. This is Paul talking about his struggle with sin. I've seen people try to explain away this section and say, well, you know, this is pre-conversion Paul. No, no, doesn't work. Doesn't work because pre-conversion Paul, pre-Christian Paul, would not love the law of God like that, would not love the law of God as a Christian. Again, if you read the whole chapter, this is even more clear. Romans chapter 7, give it a look-see. So again, this argument is that God will not forgive you if you continue to repeat the same sin. But unfortunately, that's often how sin is. Sin can be addictive. It can be something that worms its way into your very flesh, into your, into your human nature. It is infected, although human nature itself is not sinful, human nature is infected with the desire to sin. And because you have the constant desire to sin, you have the constant habit of doing sin. It may, in fact, be the same sin over and over again. I, I cannot tell you how many times people send me a message on, 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 on Discord or something like that, and they say, you know, I, I keep doing this sin. Am I really saved? And they start to question their salvation because they have been taught that their sin means that they are not saved, that their, that their continual regression to the same pile of vomit that the dog returns to, their, their continual repetition of the same sin means that somehow Christ's death does not apply. It is true that if you are unrepentant, you reject the forgiveness of God. This is true. But you can, as demonstrated by Paul, be repentant for sin that continues to persist in your life. Lutherans, we would make this distinction. We would make a distinction between, and I would say Christians would make this distinction between justification and sanctification. Now, it's a technical distinction, but I think it's helpful to understand that there's a difference between that which saves you and that which makes you live better, live less sinfully, I would say. So justification, there is, and then of course you can break it down to objective justification and subjective justification. Objective justification means that you, that God has died. Jesus died for your sin. Your sin is paid for. Subjective justification means that you do not reject that sin, but the Holy Spirit works within you and delivers that salvation to you. Justification means you are justified. You are declared just. You are declared saved before God the judge. Justification is your salvation. Then comes sanctification. Sanctification means to make holy, to cleanse, to purify. Sanctification naturally follows as a result of justification. When you are justified, you are given a new heart and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. This is why Paul is talking about the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God warring with his flesh. That is his sinful flesh, the corrupted sinful human nature that he has. It is a battle between that which is fleshly, not just physical, but fleshly, and that which is of the Spirit that is the Holy Spirit. Justification. You are saved. Sanctification. Now that you are saved, you should re you should re-examine your life. You should desire to follow the laws of God, to reject sin. Now that you are saved, now that you are a, a, a as, um, as the parable of the sower would put it, now that that seed has been planted in your soil, in your heart, the word of God planted in your heart, and it is growing, you should expect to see fruit grow eventually, although maybe you don't see it immediately. You don't look at the fruit to, to see whether or not you saved. You look at the fruit, the fruit growing in your own life to say, look at this, look at how wonderfully God is working. The fruit necessarily follows after and does not precede the life of the plant. This is how it works. You are first saved, and then once being saved, your life changes maybe imperceptibly at, at first. Maybe it is so slowly that you do not perceive the fruit that God is growing, this fruit that is maybe not yet ripe by the time you die. But God works to grow the Christian in their faith, through their actions, through their behaviors, after first saving them and indwelling them with the Holy Spirit, given at baptism or in any other means that God sees fit. Back to this argument. This guy says... That a Christian 
it, well, that you're not a Christian essentially if you continue to repeat the same the same sins. In addition to the example of Paul in Romans 7, which is one of my favorite passages, whenever I am frustrated with my own sinful nature, I see that the Apostle Paul also struggled in this way. But in terms of forgiveness, will God forgive somebody who continues to sin over and over again? Hmm. I wonder if God ever talked about a repetition of sin and a repetition of forgiveness. If only there was a passage somewhere around... Oh, look at this. It's Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and following. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Now, this is not Jesus saying, okay, and then on the 78th time, you just cast your brother out. This is Jesus saying that there is a repetition of forgiveness. Now, let me see if I can find, ah, here we go. Luke chapter 17, verses 4. This is Jesus talking. Actually, verses 3 and 4. Let's back it up a little bit. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. This is the standard that Jesus is laying out for the Christian to forgive his fellow brother. Do you not think that God is better at forgiving and holds himself to a higher standard of forgiveness than he gives you? If God commands you to continue to forgive the repeated sin of your brother against you, do you not think that his death on the cross will be continually applied to you over and over and over again for every repetition of your sin, for every repetition of your repentance, for the continuing aspect of faith in your life? This is, this is absurd that this even has to be a conversation. Of course, Christ's death forgives you for repeated sins. You cannot help but to repeat your sin. There's only 10 commandments and you have broken more than 10 of them. You have broken them more than 10 times. God's death, Christ's death on the cross continues to be applied to you, to your account. It does not cease because you cannot manage to keep sin perfectly out of your life. The forgiveness of God is not based on your perfection. It is not about you. It is about what God did for you, to you, in you. And once that has happened, what God does with you. The, the, the danger of this thinking, I mean, aside from everything that, that we've already covered here today, the danger of this thinking is that people fall into despair. Well, I've repeated my sin. And God will not forgive a repeated sin because he doesn't forgive the sin of unbelievers. And I'm an unbeliever if I have repeated my sin. Therefore, it's hopeless. This, this is the mentality that is, that is, that is inculcated by this, this fraudulent theological concept. Oh, cope and see thy sure I am doing. This post, to acknowledge your sin is to stop doing them. No! To acknowledge your sin is to acknowledge that it is wrong and you ought to stop doing them. That is what it means to acknowledge your sin. To say, yes, it's wrong. I ought not to be doing this thing. It does not mean that you magically have the willpower to cease sinning. And if you think you do, you are wrong. To acknowledge your sin is to lift Jesus up. Jesus is already lifted up, bud. Jesus has been lifted up for a long time before you were ever born. You acknowledging your sin doesn't do anything to start the process of God's forgiveness for you. God's forgiveness of you is already, is already won and, and waiting to be credited to your account. And you can continue to resist Acts 7.51. You can continue to resist the Holy Spirit and resist the forgiveness of God. But the work that has been done to forgive your sin is already completed on the cross. To acknowledge your sin is to believe in Jesus. Not necessarily.
There are some who acknowledge their sin and continue to reject the forgiveness of God. They either think that they don't need the forgiveness or they think that God won't give the forgiveness, maybe as a result of this, this poor theology. It says, you stop sin because you believe. That much, at least, is partially true. You should attempt to stop sin. You should trust in God and the Holy Spirit to sanctify you, to work on your sanctification, your resistance of sin. Because you love God, you love his forgiveness, and you don't want to continue to do, to do these things that are wrong. But it does not mean just because you have been forgiven that you now have the ability to resist all sin, that you now have a, a perfect human nature as Christ did. Closing thoughts would be this. You cannot out God's love. You can't do it. And if you think that you have, then repent because you are devaluing the death of Christ. You are devaluing the sacrifice of your Savior to say he can only forgive so much and not more. I'm sorry, God, but I am just so much more than you can handle. Repent. God died for you, for your sin, all your sin, the sin you continue to do, the sin that you will continue to do until you die. Repent and believe. Repent saying, yes, my sin is evil. My sin is wrong. I wish I had not done it. God, please forgive me. Who will save me? Oh, wretched man that I am. Romans 7 ends perfectly. Because as much as Paul is talking about this sin and this, this, this frustration with the, the inability to get away from this sin entirely, how does he end this frustration? Not in despair, not in saying there's no hope for me, a wretched man that I am is not the last thing that he says. Who will deliver me from this body of death? 25, verse, chapter 7, verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He says that he continues to sin with his flesh, but his desire is after God. The Spirit of God saves him. The Holy Spirit that dwells within him makes his heart right, his mind right, his mind focused on God, who has done the work to save him. Thanks be to God, not thanks be to me for overcoming my sin, thanks be to Jesus Christ our Lord that your sin has been paid for. That's the final word. That's the final message of this struggle between sin and the spirit, between the flesh and the spirit. Not because you can tame your flesh perfectly and make it win out. That you can perfect your imperfect flesh. That's up to God to do. But that even though you have a sinful flesh, even though your flesh follows the law of sin, you have a Savior who followed it perfectly, who died for you in your place, and whose death pays for all of your repeated sin, awful as it may be. Put your faith in Christ, not in your own works, not in your own ability to resist sin, in Christ, in his work for you. With that, I hope you have a wonderful day. God bless you and take care.